Um, okay, hello. Uh, welcome to the symposium. Symposium. Hi, hi, everyone. How are you doing? Um, I'm looking at the, my photography in context and uh, examining the links between obsessive compulsive behaviour and photographic practice. Uh, one British photographer who stands out is the Magnum photographer Martin Parr. Uh, hello, Martin. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for appearing at the uh, photosynthesis uh, symposium. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Gary Winogrand, Eugene Smith, uh, Jürgen Teller, William Eggleston, just to name a few, are photographers who display a compulsive approach to photographic practice. Uh, I'm fascinated by uh, photographers who work in this very concentrated way. Uh, what makes them tick? Uh, you're, so, you're quite famous for collecting a wide ranging array of things from uh, Sputnik memorabilia to Saddam Hussein wristwatches and of course um, postcards. I think you have about 20,000 postcards. Um, were you a collector before you took up photography? Yes, I've always been a collector because uh, even when I was a kid I collected things like fossils, bird's nests and had a small museum in the cellar of my house in Surrey. Uh, so that collecting gene has always been there. Then I went into things like stamps and coins and then by the time I was a photographer at college, so at the age of 18, I then started to think about collecting photography books. And that really was the first thing I collected and that's expanded into these other things you just mentioned like uh, the political ephemera, but the core of my collecting is still photographic books, of which I have many, many thousands. Um, has there been any um, one significant defining moment when you knew you wanted to be a photographer? I think I started because, uh, or thinking like that, because when I used to stay with my grandfather in Yorkshire when I was a teenager, he was a very keen amateur photographer and he took me out, he lent me a camera, he came back, processed film, made prints, so by about the age of 13 or 14, I decided I wanted to be a photographer. Okay. Um, in the, your um, Excess Baggage interview with uh, Sandy Toxvig, Radio 4, you mentioned uh, motorway service stations. Um, just wondering, what was the obsession with the M1? What's this? Well, I suppose the M1 is very interesting because it's now over 50 years old. So uh, in that period in the 50s, the M1 opened in 59, when Britain was rebuilding after the war, it felt like an icon of modernity. Now, of course, it feels rather faded. So its social context, if you like, has changed quite dramatically. So that's one thing I'm interested in. So I have collected a lot of postcards and ephemera to do with the opening of the M1. And now, of course, there is no postcards made of the M1 whatsoever because people just want to escape it as soon as possible. So it's fascinating to see how this ephemera and the postcards that came with it show how it's changed in our, its status within British society. Yeah, we stopped at one on the way, we couldn't find any. So. Um, do you feel compelled to photograph things or do you need to have more of a project uh, directed approach and has that changed over time? Projects are easier to work with because uh, it gives you a start, beginning and end and that means you can contain your photography and you know, I don't, I'm not these people who take a camera out every day. Yeah. I tend to either work very hard on a project uh, and then come off that or then stop and you know, I tend to sort of work very intensely yeah. and then do something else because I have a lot of other things I have to do in my life right. like admin and meetings and such like to back up the photography. Um, you've been quoted as saying um, you get your obsessive genes from your father who was an obsessive uh, bird watcher, is that true? It is true, yes. Um, I'm not sure if you watched the recent BBC Four documentary series, uh, Very British Obsession, which looked at Twitches. I, I, did, I did overlap something with the Twitches, yes, they're an obsessive bunch too. Um, do you think, um, basically, uh, in this interview, uh, one of the characters is uh, asked by interviewer, um, do you think twitching is a form of escapism? And uh, he replied, um, he felt... He got transformed into this uh, world of make-believe. I forget I'm married, unfortunately. I've got a child. I even forget that. Um, just, um, this is a twitcher. And um, <clears throat> looking at um, Gary Winogrand, a year before his death, um, an interviewer for a German television programme asked uh, Gary Winogrand why he photographed. And he said, um, how do I say it? The way I would uh, put it is I get totally out of myself. It's the closest thing I... I uh, think that comes not to uh, existing. I think uh, which is the best, which to me is attractive. So this got me thinking, uh, do you think photography is a form of escapism for dealing with 
the complexities of the world, um, a place attracting obsessive personalities to try to make some sort of reality. I think it's not just to do with photography, it's to do with any discipline, any hobby, anything that can potentially turn into an obsession. You know, people do that uh, very intensely. And uh, I wouldn't say, you know, this is how I escape from myself. I mean, I'm interested in the world and I'm trying to make pictures that relate through my photography about how I feel and interpret the world. So that's really what it's about. And that, that quest will never finish. And of course, um, you get obsessed by the medium you've chosen to explore and try to understand how it works and functions. But you can never quite predict how and when a good photograph will come up. And that's the thing that uh, keeps you on guard and keeps you hoping that next time you'll be able to achieve that. And at the same time, I'm fascinated by the, the intent to try and document the things that I'm addressing, whether that's the UK, the black country where I've done a lot of work yeah. recently, or whether it's uh, you know, a particular short, sharp story about something else around the world. So you think if you had chosen a different career, you'd be just as... Of course, yes. I mean, uh, you know, anyone who's successful has to be obsessed. It's not a, an extraordinary thing. It's just commonplace. If you're not obsessed, as some of you lot there aren't, yeah. you've got a problem. You won't, you'll be failures. You know, you won't make, you won't go out and get a career in photography. You'll just be one of the majority that go to college and end up doing something else. Um, your projects are quite diverse, from the conceptual parking spaces to the auto portrait. Um, one of, a friend of mine, Wayne Ford, is a former art director at the uh, Observer magazine, and he's also an obsessive collector of photo books. And he listed one of your books, um, Obvious and Ordinary America, um, in one of his top ten photo narrative book collections. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> um, it's a collaboration between, for people who don't know, it's uh, between the uh, Martin Parr and uh, photographer John Gossage and he, uh, Wayne, described um, as two highly distinctive soloists singing from the same song sheet. Um, there's very little in, uh, information in that book. Um, so were you in the same car? Were you taking the same route? Or um... Well technically we didn't do it because uh, our names are not even in the you know, book. Yeah, that's why, yeah. uh, but of course we did and indeed we were in the same car and we were on the same journey. What's fascinating is that you can send people on the same thing and they'll come up with two entirely yeah. different views. And I think that's a good example. We weren't even in the same town. We were literally in the same places. And yet our photographs are entirely different. That is one of the pleasures of photography, how yeah. you can apply uh, your own sensitivity, your own voice to a given situation and come up with a different interpretation. Um, on that trip, um, it was to meet um, William Eggleston. The, he was another famous... Uh, compulsive photographer. Um, is that true? Yes, we met Bill. I mean, I have to clarify this, all photographers who are any good are compulsive and obsessive. You keep saying as if it's an extraordinary thing. It's standard. It's bog standard. So let me just clarify that for you. It's because it's uh, my research project I'm looking at. Yeah, well, I'm just telling you here and now, anyone who's vaguely successful, right. and indeed even more vaguely successful, like quite successful, is obsessive. That's the bottom line. Great. Um, what are your opinions on uh, Bill's uh, obsessive nature? What drove him? What do you think? Did you recognise any? Very good. I mean, he was a great original photographer. And he uh, you know, reinvented the whole way in which we think about colour, which was quite an achievement. So, uh, I mean, he's not shooting as well now as he was uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. But his contribution to photography is already um, yeah. firmly set in stone. Um, I find myself attracted to some of the Japanese photographers. Um, in the, the photo book, History, uh, edited by yourself and Jerry Badger, um, there's Masa Hishi Fukasi's 1986 book, uh, Ravens, which was voted as the, the best photo book in the last 25 years in this BJ people. Uh, you talk about him focusing obsessively on these flocks of ravens uh, he observed. Uh, images uh, described as aesthetic tour de force. Uh, what attracted you to those particular images, and can you empathise with the work? Sure, I mean, it's a great body of work. I mean, uh, we put it in the book. I wasn't actually on the voting panel, but it certainly would have been in my top five for the last uh, 30, 40 years. And uh, it, it's remarkable. It just works. You know, he just, his obsession, the loss of his wife, you know, her going off, all articulated it so perfectly and beautifully with these photographs of the ravens. So it just came, come, comes together in the way that sometimes some things do, and it's just a genius piece of work. Yeah, okay. How or why you can describe that is very difficult. 
you know you can't exactly analyze why it works so perfectly but yeah. that's one of the great mysteries of photography um do you have a copy of the book of course <laughs> <laughs> what a daft question can I, will, <laughs> can I have a look later okay um, you have described yourself in interviews as a tourist, uh, using camera as a tool to reveal the differences between uh, reality and mythology. Uh, Susan Sontag uh, says in, uh, in the book on photography, uh, most tourists feel compelled to put a camera between themselves and whatever uh, it is that's remarkable they encounter. Uh, unsure of their responses, they take a picture. This, gave, this gives shape to the experience. Stop and take a photo, move on. Uh, this method um, especially appeals to people handicapped by a ruthless work ethic. Uh, Germans, Japanese, Americans. So using a camera... Handicapped? Why, why the word handicapped? Uh, this is Susan Sontag's word. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, using a camera... She's dead, so we can't argue with <laughs> <that>. camera... <laughs> Using a camera appeases the anxiety which uh, the work-driven feel about not working. So this is her words. Um, so do you think anxiety and photographic compulsion are perhaps linked? Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, anxiety can be part of an obsession, sure. It doesn't have to be, but it sometimes is. Okay. But do you think there's anything related to this, uh, what she says about the, the work ethic that perhaps German, Japanese, American... I mean, I mean, well, German, Japanese are very good photographers, you know, so I don't know whether that's because they're more obsessive. I mean, it doesn't necessarily follow, does it? No, no. I mean, uh, we, we mustn't over-intellectualise this. I mean, maybe that's your job, but my job is just to get on with the work. Yeah. Um, in an interview with the, the Newport School uh, Art, Media and Design, you say you edit very quickly. Um, quote, there's a lot of crap and uh, you know crap when you see it. Um, you've, been, you've described in The Guardian that you listen to radio while editing, something you describe as mundane. Um, <clears throat> Winogrand left, famously, thousands of roles undeveloped. Um, John Sarkozy described him as, at the end of his career as a, a habit without an impulse, one who continued to work after a fashion, like an overheated engine that will not stop after even the key has been turned off. Uh, leading on from that, would you say um, the process of making the photographs is perhaps more important to you than actually collecting photographs? Uh, no, I'd say the process is an integral part of it, but the important thing is to get the photographs. But, you know, unlike Winogrand, I edit exactly as I go along, right, yeah. very accurately and very quickly, which then go into my archive, which then go into the Magnum website. So. You know, I have that completely under control and very together on that front. That's great. Um, that might be a problem, might be why I'm a bit dull as a photographer. No. Uh, so obsessive personality we've talked about um, before the interview can be destructive. Um, for the magnum photographer, uh, Eugene Smith, uh, three weeks turned into a three-year commitment as he dis attempted to describe, understand and better uh, the world he saw around him with uh, no less than 21,000 photographic moments. Um, using alcohol and amphetamines uh, to sort of allow him to continue his workaholic pace. Um, you have described yourself as obsessive uh, photographer. So saying if you were going to make it anywhere, uh, you need to be obsessive. It takes you over and eats you up. But don't worry, it's a good thing. Um, do you have any sort of, you know, talk us through that statement. And do you suffer from like insomnia or any symptoms? Uh, what keeps you in balance? Um, I mean, I'm quite a balanced person. I get up early. So I don't need so much sleep. And one of the reasons why I get a lot done is because I get up early. Yeah. You know, I'm at work at half six, seven. So you have a like, set routine? Uh, well, I mean, I sleep in a little bit longer in winter than in the summer. But in the summer, I'm definitely up early. So when you have a project, does it really... Yeah, because you work, you said you... Well, I have many projects at the same time. They're all running along parallel. So they all, you know, I just have... To, my time, my problem is working out how and when to do it. I think every day for the next two months, I'm busy. So if something else comes up, I won't be able to do it, which is a drag because it might be very interesting. But you, you don't say you suffer from it like uh, in a negative no, no, way. No, no, no. It's, it's all positive. No. Okay. Um, do you do things like walking or how do you... Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, have, I do have time off from photographing and working, but not so much. Why would you have time off from the very thing you love? Exactly. Um, which is about... This is why I'm probably obsessed. Uh, the last quick questions, anyway. Um, anyone can take a photograph, but in your mind, what do you think makes a great photograph? Well, it's when the photographer and the subject matter connect together in a meaningful way. Okay. Collector or photo uh, photographer? Both. <laughs> if, you, if you had one principal uh, rule to give the young uh, British photographers uh, listening, um, your final sort of principle, what would it be? 
you're not obsessive enough. You're not passionate enough. You know, most of you out there are lazy. Get out and let's see who out of this <laughs> lot here have really got it in them. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, that concludes the uh, interview. Thank you. Okay. Cheers.